Welcome everyone. Namaste. Thank you for taking some time in your day to be here, to listen, to learn, or perhaps refresh some of the notions we're going to be looking at today. And before we get started, I want to invite you to join me for a brief grounding meditation. So we'll start by sitting up straight, relaxing our shoulders, relaxing our face. Take a slow inhale through your nose. Open your mouth, breathe out. Feel your breath. Feel your body. And feel the earth beneath you. Parts of your body that are in contact with the earth or with the surface you are sitting on. Take a slow inhale, send a breath deep into your lungs. Open your mouth, breathe out. Take one more breath like this. Hold the breath at the top just for a second. Deep inhale. And open your mouth, release the breath. To release your shoulders. Take any movements that feel good. If you want to take a stretch, you can. You can make movements with your arms. Anything that your body needs, let it happen. Okay, so welcome again, everyone. When you're ready, you can blink your eyes open. And before we get started, I just want to say, introduce myself very briefly, because I don't know all of you personally, I do know some of you. Um, my name is Melissa, and uh, I've been practicing yoga for over 10 years, maybe 12. And now I'm a yoga teacher. Um, and for many years, I practice yoga. I didn't actually know what yoga was for. <laughs> I thought it was mostly to relax and to um, be flexible. Does anyone think that or did anyone, is that a, a, maybe a common belief? Um, and this is not our fault, right? Because we are in some way quite far removed from the origins of yoga. Um, but as I discovered the true purpose, the true meaning of yoga, I felt a really deep, um, purpose, a, a longing to share the wisdom, uh, the information that's behind the physical practice. Um, and so this is why we're here today. And also to raise funds for the Nagabe Buble uh, people in Panama. Um, so we'll be learning and we're contributing positively to people who are in need. And you'll see that there's a correlation between the two. Um, and if during the presentation, because I'm going to share my screen, if you have some questions, um, you can raise your hand, I think, in the chat, or you can, you can even unmute yourselves, um, although my intention is to allow a little bit of time for questions at the end. So um, if you have a hot burning question, go ahead, and otherwise you can uh, pop it in the chat or all right. So we'll get started. Like I said, I'm going to share my screen, so you should all be able to see my screen now, right? So the values and principles of yoga, a practical guide, because we're going to learn about how we can put these into practice in our daily modern lives. Um, so the first question really is what is yoga? Um, when we look at these two pictures, both kind of fit some of our ideas of what yoga is. Um, and 
I'm going to share a little bit more. <laughs> I need to move you guys again to another side. Um, so the fact that yoga is, well, to be said between 5,000 5, and up to 10,000 years old, let that sink in, 10,000 years, um, means that it's hard to really trace back to its origins. So um, yoga was, from what we are told, transcribed on palm leaves. So yoga being the, the scientific, the philosophical uh, writings of yoga. Some refer to it as an art, a philosophy, a science. Uh, and when we're written on palm leaves, but of course you can imagine a palm leaf won't last 10,000 years, not even a week probably. So a lot of these um, teachings were passed through the oral tradition. Um, this does mean that we have a little bit of a problem when it comes to pinpointing the exact origin. We do know it originated in India, and there are some things that seem to be repeated through the different lineages of yoga. So this is just a little bit about the background. Um, and um, <laughs> I like this these two images again, yoga then versus yoga now, we do have this idea that like to be a yogi in India 5,000 years ago, probably it was very different to what it means to be a yogi now. Um, the question is, is there anything similar between the two? Like is yoga now in the modern times in the Western world actually rooted in what yoga was then? Is there anything from the essence um, that is in today's practices. Um, so I pose the question, is modern yoga anything like yoga 5,000 years ago? So um, like I said, there aren't so many texts. We have the Rig Vedas, which is where the first, the first time the word yoga appears. Um, and we also have the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So Patanjali was known to be a sage and he synthesized all the wisdom he could in 295, some say 196 sutras. Sutras are very brief sentences known as aphorisms. And in the 196 sutras, only three talk about asana. That's the physical posture. So all the other sutras talk about everything else, mind, uh, ego, mind control, meditation, um, and physical posture is only three out of 195 sutras. So it does make us to think when you go to a yoga class today, you'll probably be guided from one pose to another. So you're like, hmm, <laughs> there's a bit of a gap there, right? Um, so let's look at the Yoga Sutras by Patanjali. Uh, these are the yoga, uh, the eight limbs rather. So in the sutras, he refers to these eight limbs, the Ashtanga. Anga is a limb and Asht means eight in um so you may have in Sanskrit, so you may have heard the, the word, the term Ashtanga Yoga. And so these are the eight limbs. So first we have Yama, which is what we're going to focus on today. These are referred, referred to as restraints, internal or personal restraints. Then we have the Niyamas, which are external restraints. We have Asana, which is number three, that's the physical posture. Pranayama is breath work, which is often used in class as well. Pratyahara, which means withdrawal of the senses. Don't worry, you don't need to memorize this or even <laughs> understand it. Uh, it's just to give you an idea. And then we have dharana, which is uh, concentration. Dhyana, which is meditation. And samadhi, which is uh, nirvana. I mean, nirvana is to put it very simply, but dissolution of the ego, which gives us the experience of total oneness. So today we're going to focus on the very first limb, the yamas, um, which are what we could say the first values of yoga. So what are the yamas? The, um, the, world, the word yama has many different interpretations from restraint to moral imperatives or ways in which we interact with the world as well as respect for others. I like respect for others the most, uh, is the one that resonates the most with me, uh, but you can pick whichever one makes most sense to you. And there are five yamas, and they are ahinza, nonviolence, satya, truthfulness, asteya, non-stealing, 
brahmacharya, discipline, and aparigraha, non-hoarding or non-attachment. We're going to look at all of these individually, so you don't need to take note. We're going to take our time. So what do they mean and how can we integrate them into our lives? This is where it gets more interesting. <laughs> So we've got here Mahatma Gandhi because he's really, I think, the most symbolic, most um, important teacher of our times, at least, um, of nonviolence, a uh, real inspiration. And uh, so Ahinza, it's said with an N, is known to be the practice of nonviolence towards ourselves and others, not only in action, but also of thought and speech. So this is important. Thought as well is part of this. Inner violence is the, is the cause of outer disharmony. So any disharmony in the world is a reflection of inner violence. And inner disharmony is the cause of outer violence. So when there's disharmony inside, there's violence outside, right? This is a very simple yogic concept that we can understand. If we were all in peace with ourselves, there would be no violence in the world. So to explain it more simply. Ahinza reminds us that our thoughts, words, and acts inevitably impact others. We should aspire to minimize violence within ourselves to promote harmony in the world. So yoga really tells us it begins with you. So if you're violent towards yourself, the likelihood is that you are being violent towards others. Um, just inviting someone else into the... the class okay hopefully they've been able to join um so now we're going to look at how we can um how we oh yeah so the easiest way to attain inner harmony is through yoga so the union with all now how can we apply this into our lives so if you ask yourself right now it seems easy, right? Like, don't be violent. Okay, don't hit people. We get it, right? We've been told since a child, like, don't hit people. That's not a nice thing to do. And if you ask yourself with full honesty, if you consider yourself to be a violent person, ask yourself the question. The answer is probably no for most of us, um, right? Like, we don't tend to want to be violent or consider ourselves to be violent. If I ask you now, would others consider you a violent person? Maybe, probably not, hopefully not. <laughs> um, and now a more interesting question, are you ever violent with your words or even with your thoughts? Now that's more subtle. What does it mean to be violent with your thoughts? Do you ever make judgments on people? Do you ever judge yourself? And this class is not to make you feel bad in any way. It's rather to empower us to be more self-aware. So when we are able to identify that we have violent thoughts, we can then look at them, observe them. Where do they originate? And how do they impact the world around me? So a way to, a way to um, diminish violence in the world is to pause to ask yourself how your, how your actions may impact others. So every time you're going to do something, pause and ask yourself, is this going to have an impact on someone? And the chances are that yes. Um, and I like to, I was thinking about examples, like how could I make this simple to understand? But for example, um, if you're doing something that's harmful to you, you might think like, well, why does anyone even care? I'm just hurting myself. But say you're doing something that's harmful for your health, but someone who loves you is hurt by seeing you doing something that harms you. So you're not only hurting yourself, you're also hurting the people who love you. And this is not to say that we are responsible for everyone's thoughts on what we do. However, we are responsible for how our actions impact us that how impact others and ourselves directly and it's very um naive to think that our actions only impact us and yoga yoga is the union of all tells us we are interrelated we are all linked so anything that you do will have an impact it can have a positive impact or a negative impact so ahinza says 
consider, consider this when you make a decision. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next one. Satya. Okay, so Satya is known as truthfulness and um, truthfulness in all ways. So in all senses of the term, it invites us to observe our truth in thought, word and action and live accordingly. We walk the path of truth. We must remember to consider the first yama. So it's not because we're moving up the yamas that then we're like, oh, don't worry about ahinza. If saying the truth to someone is going to hurt them, maybe consider not telling them or not telling them in that way. Um, so still respecting the first yama as we move through the other yamas. So before speaking, we must examine, examine whether the intention to speak is rooted in the welfare of all beings, right? So before we speak, again, pause. What is the intention? What is the purpose? Is it necessary? Um, and we're going to look in ways at which you can um, practice satya in your daily life. Uh, so first, we're going to ask, I like asking these questions, because if, so, if someone asks you if you were, is anyone a liar? Like, if I ask you if anyone's a liar, you're probably going to be like, no. <laughs> um, but can you think of a time you shared something that turned out to be untrue? Has that ever happened that you've said something and then you're like, well, that wasn't technically true? Um, and have you ever shared information you got from social media, but you didn't verify yourself? Like someone told you something and then so you, you said it to someone else and it wasn't a bad intention, but you were saying something as if it was true, but you didn't actually know if it was true. Anyone done that? So this satya is a really crucial yama in our age of myths and disinformation because so many things are being said as truths and they can really be damaging. So we can really play it down by being like, oh, it's just a white lie, you know, it's just like, I just said it passingly, but you don't know how that piece of information of misinformation is going to impact the person who heard it. So this yama invites us to be really thoughtful and intentional with the words we use because they have an impact. It does matter if it's true or not. And if you're even, for example, saying jokes, but people are not sure whether you're joking or not, this yama says, rectify, make sure that you're clear, be clear, be truthful with your word. Your words do matter. So if you're not sure if someone understood you or not, if you're not sure that what you said was true or not, repair, contact them, let them know, be honest. We'll move on to the next one. So Asteya, non-stealing, resisting the desire for that which does not belong to us. Understanding Asteya may seem easy enough until we expand the notion of stealing beyond items to include space, time, and even opportunities and ideas. Um, oh, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now, Christina? Can everyone hear me okay? Here? Okay, good. I'll continue then. Um, so if we expand ex um, the, this concept to time, space, opportunities, and ideas, all of a sudden we're like, okay, I mean, maybe um, I have stolen in the past. Um, I have another message. Oh, you figured it out. Great. <laughs> Um, so, for example, interrupting someone in conversation can be see seen as stealing their chance to be understood, right? We may not think of it as stealing in the first place, but if someone's talking and we interrupt them, we're, we're taking that away from them, that opportunity for them to express themselves. Or touching someone, assuming they won't mind, can be seen as stealing their personal space. And we, we, we don't take this so seriously because we're, not, we're like, okay, this is minor. Um, and it may seem minor, but... Asteya tells us, consider these things. So if I ask you again the question, have you ever stolen an item from a store? Well, maybe you have. <laughs> um, but is it something you do regularly? Probably not. Do you consider yourself a thief? Hopefully not. <laughs> maybe you do. <laughs> um, but have you ever borrowed an idea from someone without telling them? Maybe. That's more likely that it may happen. Um, so like the others, Asteya seems obvious on the surface, but think about what a disciplined practice of Asteya would look like. 
Become aware of little ways in, we, in which you steal attention or space. For example, you go to a gathering and you eat more than what you need. And then there's less for the others. And we may not think about this, but if we're taking more than what we need, if there's enough just for the amount of people that are there and we're taking more, someone is going to have less. And we may not think about it initially, but this is what Astea says, you are part of a bigger group, you're a part of the whole. Take what you need, don't steal from others, because even if you don't, if you're not taking it from their plate, because that's what we would think as stealing, when you take more than what you need, you are stealing indirectly. Um, so for example, monopolizing conversation, you're not giving others an opportunity to speak, and so therefore you're stealing their opportunity to speak. Or I like this one. This is someone I hadn't thought of before, someone I hadn't thought of before. Wearing a strong scent in a space where others can't not smell you. Maybe they don't like that scent, right? Like a really strong patchouli or like something that you like, but that's imposing your preferences if you're going to be in an enclosed space. So really learning to be considerate, to be mindful. How does my presence impact in this space? How does my existence impact the world? Um, and allowing that to be extended until we're very much aware of ourselves. Um, and in a beautiful way, you know, learning how we can live in harmony with our environment, um, considering other people's needs. So using what you need with gratitude and giving back to pay it forward. So it may be that someone offers you to take something. It, Astea doesn't say don't take it. It says, of course, take it and then pay it back. How are you giving back to the world? Make sure you're accepting, of course, but how are you giving back? What are you giving back? Um, and so when someone something comes to you, let it come. When something leaves, let it go. This is one of Sachida. Sachidananda's um, quotes, don't force, don't hang on too tightly. Just little reminders of how we can apply Asteya in our daily lives. Next one is Brahmacharya or self-discipline or moderation. So on the left, we've got what most people will, would imagine to be a Brahmachari um, or a renunciate. So people who renounce to all earthly pleasures. Sometimes brahmacharya is translated as, as celibacy or abstinence of sex. That's how I was taught it when I did my yoga teacher training. But recently, I learned from another teacher who was saying, actually, if we look at the breakdown, the word breakdown, brahman, is what we referred to as pure consciousness. Um, and so it's actually devoting all our energy to this pure consciousness. So yes, if we enjoy excess food, excess sex, excess shopping, excess alcohol, excess anything, we're losing energy that we could be investing in this um, pursuit of our self-realization, which is the higher purpose. So think of this as devout, um, devoting every act and every thought towards the same inquiry who is Brahman or who am I? So this can sound a little bit out there, um, like as a question, like what in everything I do, I'm asking who is Brahman, um, but rather in our modern world, we can say like, how can I practice moderation? So we're gonna look at how we can apply it. So question to yourself, do you ever prioritize instant gratification over spiritual evolution? You might be like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> How do I measure that? How do I know? Um, have you ever chosen social media or Netflix over meditation? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe some are like, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, think about it in this way. Where your mind goes, your energy flows. So be become aware of where you spend your time and energy. These little phones social media is a little bit like a vortex that draws your energy in and you can some people talk of like oh like I got lost in or like I got distracted for however long but if you think about it we are we choose we create our lives we choose what we invest our energy in but if we allow something else to decide on our behalf then we're not being conscious where our energy is being almost like it's not stolen because we're giving it to whatever this is 
Um, and Brahmacharya is saying, stay focused, stay on the, on the path. Uh, and one of the reasons why the world looks the way it does is because people are in a limbo of, of desperately looking for something that can only be experienced when you stop looking frantically. When you stop trying to buy more things, trying to like have more, and this is the next, um, the next yama actually. But Brahmacharya said, be moderate, eat just enough food, have just enough things, be moderate, practice moderation. You can have sexual relationships. Don't have them every night with someone you don't know. Uh, and this is not a criticism to anyone who has done this or does this. Um, it's more an observation as to what yoga is pointing at. It's telling us, be mindful of your energy because it's precious. Don't spread it around. Be, be mindful. That's what it tells us. So practice moderation. Notice when and where you tend to live in excess. Recognize the impact on your spiritual practice. What happens when you live in excess? If you eat too much and you try to meditate afterwards, how does it feel? Hard. It's a lot harder because your body's trying to digest. How does it feel if you consume, say, too much um, social media and then you try to meditate or practice yoga? Your mind is scattered. Consider how ex excess impacts your spiritual practice. So start to learn stopping when you've had enough. And even learning to redefine what does enough mean? Like, how do I define enough? Um, so this takes us beautifully into the next uh, yama, which is this little box is really annoying because I like seeing you guys, but I need to move it. Ooh, someone's coming in. Better late than never. <laughs> Okay, so next yama is aparigraha, non-possession. So I like this image that we have on the left, just so you can see it, this idea that everything we have is just temporary, right? Like sand just slipping through our fingers. Um, so aparigraha is sometimes referred to as non-attachment. I like the definition or the one that resonates more, most is non-possession. Non-possession is a philosophy that holds that no one or anything possesses anything. In Hinduism and Jainism, aparigraha is the virtue of non-possessiveness, non-grasping, or non-greediness. I think non-greediness is also a term that I resonate with. And aparigraha reminds us that material objects cannot be truly possessed as they, like everything in nature, are impermanent and will eventually perish. Um, I like this quote that says, only is yours what does it what remains after a shipwreck so imagine you're on a boat and everything goes and everything sinks and even your body perishes the only thing that is yours is your soul at the end of it the atman is the only thing that is left and so many of us spend this life trying to get more <laughs> unaware that at the end of it or not unaware forgetting that at the end of it we don't take any of it it all stays on this side and we can't take it onto the next life. If you believe that there are, like yogis believe that there are multiple lives, you can ac accumulate all you want um, in the next life. You're not taking any of it. <laughs> Even if you have a plan or a way, there, there is no evidence that that has ever been possible. Um, another interpretation of aparigraha is non-hoarding, but can be translated as not wanting, non-attachment or greedlessness. Buddha tells us the cause of suffering is desire and aversion to aparigraha, concerns the desire for things. So I was thinking about this earlier on and how much I wanted to convey how we don't need a tenth of what we have. For two millions of years, human beings existed without banks, without refrigerators, without cupboards, without storage areas, without uh, savings accounts, without backup plans, without, um, without any of those things. No cars, no, no plan Bs, no partners who help them financially <laughs> uh, because there were no such thing as finances per se as we consider them now. 
Yet we believe in a time where this idea of acquiring more money, more possessions, gives us a, a sense of certainty, which is, of course, a complete illusion, because as we've seen in relatively recent times, the only thing you really have is your health. Um, and having more things doesn't give you health. Eating well in the moment does give you health, but health is not even really cumulative, because if you stop looking after yourself, then you become unhealthy. So all you can do is care for yourself in the moment. So having more, and, and, and really this is, I think a really serious topic because um, when we look at how much people tend to have in their homes, we even have programs, I think called like the hoarders or something like that. Um, I, I've, I, don't, I don't have a TV, so I don't know exactly, but I, I've seen, I've glimpsed that. There are people who have houses full of things and things and things and things. And what we're not considering is that if you have tons of toilet paper or kilos of toilet paper, well, that has an impact on the environment. It's, it's not, there's, it's irrefutable. If you have tons of tinned tuna, that means that there are less fish in the sea, just so you can have this sense of security. And, and again, this is not an accusation at anyone living in this way, because this is an opportunity not to beat yourself up, but to become aware of how you live. How do you, how mindful are you? How conscious are you? How do you make your decisions in life? And then from that place, we're empowered and we can choose to, to be different, um, to make different decisions. So um, the question, how do we apply um, aparigraha in our life? Um, have you ever taken more than you need? Asking yourself like in different contexts, have you ever taken more than you need? I, I know I certainly have, whether it's food, whether it's opportunities, whether it's things. I definitely had moments where I took more than I needed. Is it my fault? No, I, I grew up like most of us in this, idea of scarcity that the more you had the better you would be the safer it was so no it's not our fault of course not is it our responsibility yes because when we have more someone has less when we have we need to have more and more and more and more, more someone is lacking and we can see it in today's geopolitical climate some people have nothing and some people have excess tons and it's so easy to look at them the people who have numerous properties and planes and jets it's easy to look at them and be like yeah they have way too much but what about me do I need everything I have and I and I, I tell you this I ask myself this question regularly and living as a nomad forces me to let go of things and I can tell you that it's not easy. Like I'm definitely practicing aparigraha as best as I can, but I still feel attachment. I get attached to things. I'm like, oh, but I like this. I do like it. And aparigraha doesn't say that you cannot have things. It tells you don't have too much. Don't be attached to it. You're not taking it with you anyway. Uh, so a practice that I really like to practice non aparigraha is to give away things that you like. Um, I've done this a few times with uh, with friends, like giving a dress that you like. It can be really good just to, or I mean, I use a dress as an example. Maybe I should use a book rather. Um, but giving something that is meaningful to you to share it with someone else from this place of like pure giving. This can be a really great practice to teach us non-attachment, aparigraha. And then you'll notice you don't even miss it in your life. You think you don't want to let go of it. And then when it's not there, you're like, oh, I didn't even remember I had that. Um, when it might have such a beautiful, positive impact on this other person's life who didn't have that. So you've had it, pass it on. If you have a library full of books, unless you're reading them, pass them on. We don't need to have libraries because we can then give a book and get a book, right? Like I, I've always thought about this. Why do we have libraries? And like in home, I remember my, my granddad had many books at home and I think it's beautiful to have books, but share them, share the wisdom, share the knowledge, give them to people, let the circulation of energy happen and be part of it. Let there be movement of funds, of finances, of food, of love, of everything. Um, 
so again, the question, do you have more than you need? Does anyone think they have more than you need? You can raise your hand internally if you like. Uh, I still think I have more than I need. I think probably most of us on this call have more than we need. I'm not accusing anyone, but realistically, if you're on this call, you probably have more than you need. Um, and that's okay, because the idea, again, is not to like be like, you are bad. <laughs> it's more to, or I am bad. It's more to be like, okay, how much of what I have do I really need? And how much can I release? Can I share? Can I give? Um, recycle, perhaps? Do you ever ask yourself how much you truly need and who misses out when you have more than you need? If we regard the next person's needs as highly as we do our own, our behavior might be a lot different. I think this is really important. Why do we have this idea that like, I think I, I heard of this um, during at the beginning of the, of the issues that were happening with confinements that people were taking all the toilet paper. And that for me was horrific because I was thinking like, this is such a um, representation of the human condition at the moment, this lack of concern for others. And you may think like, well, I'm gonna take it because others will take it. But then if we're all behaving like that, we live in the world that we live in today. Whereas if you start being like, I'm going to take just what I need for this week. And even then that could be, we could say, you know, I was talking about two, for 2 million years, human beings lived without toilet paper and they either wiped their butts with water or with um, leaves and they survived because our species is still alive. Um, so do we really need all that we have? Do we need tons of toilet paper? And I'm using this example because it's tangible in a way, but but consider that others need what you think you need in the same way, right? And just because others are behaving that way does not give us permission to behave in that way because we want to be conscious, especially when we are on the path of yoga on this journey. So if you're on this call now, you're at least interested, you're curious. So make decisions from this place of consciousness, um, please. <laughs> Uh, and consider your impact on the environment and the next generations when making decisions on what to buy and or use in terms of natural resources. Again, you know, like I know of people who run baths daily and um, I don't judge them because we all operate from our level of consciousness. This is not to make a judgment of opinion on anyone. We can all, we only take responsibility for ourselves, but consider Everything you do has an impact. How do you live your life and how, how much do you have? How, how does it impact the environment, the future generations? Okay, so how do we put all of this into practice, right? It might feel a little bit like, ah, so many, so many things to think about. Um, and I really like this quote by Sadhguru. He says, yoga is a technology. If you learn to use it, it works. No matter where you come from or what you believe in or do not believe in. So I'll leave you with that for a moment. Yoga is a technology. If you learn to use it, it works. No matter where you come from or what you believe in or do not believe in, okay? Um, this is the bibliography. I just shared Google images and uh, for the sake of Asteya non-stealing. And I use the manual from the teacher training my friend and I offer. Um, and so thank you on behalf of the Nagave Google community. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to talk just a little bit more, um, but back on here um, about the link between yoga, the practice, and um, and everything that we spoke about now about the yamas. So you might think like, okay, so if the yoga sutras don't talk about physical practice and um, the yamas are like, this is the values are the most important, where does asana fit in? Like, do I even still go to yoga? Um, if you're asking that question, the answer is yes. Because the eight limbs of yoga gives us a comprehensive, system on our path to self-realization okay so is just as important as pranayama just as meditation uh, just as um, important as concentration 
just as important as asana, as physical practice. And as we become more embodied, more aware of ourselves, I noticed this at the beginning when I start working with people and they've never practiced yoga. And for example, I'll say like, move your left leg. And there's like a delay between the, the command we could say and the reaction because there is a disconnection. People are not connected to themselves. Again, an observation, not a criticism or an accusation. But through the practice of yoga, you first connect with you. Wait, what's my left leg? What's my, what, my breathing space, my heart, my mind? Okay, who am I? Who am I? Not as the like the ego identity, but who am I in the wider sense? I am the Atman. I am Brahman. Um, and please forgive me if these terms or or these concepts are are rather big. Um, but really, this is what yoga is inviting us to do. It's inviting us to consider all areas of our lives. And before we come onto the mat. Where did I buy my mat from? Who is the yoga teacher? Where, what space am I practicing in? Where are my leggings from? Like all these things are part of your yoga practice. So I, you know, I, I often say this, like if you, if you practice, if you go to a studio six times a week, but you're not kind with the person on reception, you're not practicing yoga, you're, you're doing physical exercise, not as an accusation, an observation, witnessing, silent, non-judgmental witness. But don't fool yourself into thinking that practicing an intense vinyasa makes you a yogi. Not at all. <laughs> really, it's yoga, the union of all, the oneness that we can experience, through the practice of physical yoga, through the practice of pranayama, breath work, that enable us to remember that we are part of a really big disconnected family. And each one of us has a role to play, has an impact, is important. Um, so this does not mean that you need to change your entire life, how you live in this moment, because um, big changes take time. However, if this is new, if these concepts are new, if, if this has made like some pennies drop and you're like, hmm, yeah, I guess I could be more mindful around this. Um, be kind to yourself. Remember Ahimsa, the very first, the very first Yama, is kindness, nonviolence. So if you're thinking about this, say today, later, or tomorrow, and you're like whipping yourself, you've already violated the first yama. Put the whip away, be kind to yourself, compassion, observe, and go back, return, return to your breath. Let's take a deep breath in together, all together. That is yoga. It's giving us tools to operate in the world. And so to think that these, these yamas, these observances, these re restraints are, we think about 800 years old, but they're much older because um, Patanjali took them from existing teachings. This means in India, 5,000 years ago, they were already saying, don't take more than what you need because the human being had the ego as soon as he became conscious and the ego wants more, more, more. The soul doesn't need more. The soul is full. The soul is satisfied. The soul is oneness. Who wants more? The ego wants more. So anytime you're catching yourself in this like feeling of wanting, of desiring more, pause and ask yourself, who wants more? Who wants more? It's the little self that thinks that it's, that it's incomplete. More, whatever it is, more experiences, more money, more, more, more food when you're eating. And it's often to get a feeling of fullness, which no thing can give you, but practice can. So practices like asana combined with pranayama, with meditation, these practices are powerful because they can remind you of who you are in your essence and give you the experience of fullness 
you are looking for everywhere else in your life but are left feeling not satiated because no matter how much how much you shop no matter how much you eat you don't get that feeling of fullness you might get an illusion of it like a sense of it for a few minutes but at the end of it again that emptiness that lack and this is why religion exists because people are searching for something more this is why people take really hardcore drugs because they're looking for something this is why there is excess because we're all in this search of something of something there's got to be more what is it where is it it's not tangible but we know there is more how do we access it yoga is telling you sit down be silent be still it's there it's always there it's pure consciousness and that's the essence of your being, not the ego thinking mind that tells you that it's not, that you're incomplete and that only when you get more, you will be complete. So these are the first, um, I'd say the core values of yoga from the Ashtanga lineage. Um, and they can be interpreted in many ways. So I've given you my interpretation from the teachers I've learned from, from a blog I found on, on Google as well, that I found very helpful in a, in a modern translation. But depending on who you ask, you could have different definitions. And the invitation after this workshop is for you to apply these in your life as best as you can. And remember that Really, we can only live by example. We can le lead by example. So if you feel frustrated that other people are not following the yamas, um, unless they've asked you, it's probably not the best to be like, you're over buying or you're doing too much. Like that causes more first yama, ahimsa, ahimsa. So remembering the first, the very first yama, nonviolence nonviolence always compassion always for yourself and for others so if other people are violating the yamas they are in apariraha they're lying and they're over consuming don't go and attack them because then you're violating a yama as well so you respect the yamas as best as you can incorporating them in your daily life as best as you can um and be patient, be mindful, be conscious. And whenever you notice that you haven't been, again, that breath, the pause. And I start again, and I start again, and I start again, because this is exactly the spiritual journey. The spiritual journey is just one, not, is not just one long line where you start at the bottom and you get to the top without any hiccups. The spiritual journey is actually circular. We pass through the same, we might find ourselves in the same cycles and slowly we begin to catch ourselves and notice that we've fallen back to this cycle. And then from there, we can make a different empowered decision, remembering the yamas, remember the, remembering the practice. Um, so even when you're practicing your asana, consider the other yamas. That first one, ahimsa, if you're hurting yourself in your physical practice, Remember the very root of yoga, nonviolence to yourself and to others. Um, yeah, and so many other things to say about this, but, um, but I, I think this is quite a lot of information already. <laughs> um, I hope you feel like it's been comprehensive, like you, you expanded your understanding of the values of yoga, that you don't see it maybe just as a physical practice if you had that understanding before. Um, and now I'll open to questions if there are any questions about this or any comments. Uh, now is the time you can unmute yourself or type in the chat as ever, however you prefer. I had a question, or I guess more of a a comment for discussion maybe <laughs> um i was thinking about uh nonviolence and you know gandhi being an example of nonviolence 
And I know um, Martin Luther King followed in Gandhi's example, uh, using nonviolence as, as his way of being a civil rights leader. Um, and so I think about this idea of nonviolence um, and also like social justice. Um, and sometimes those two things feel like they can come into contradiction with each other um, because obviously, you know, there were people who did not like Martin Luther King and did not like Gandhi or what they stood for. Um, and so I, that's one thing that I think I struggle sometimes with reconciling, um, you know, speaking about what I think is socially just um, and at the same time practicing that nonviolence um, and not being, you know, accusatory of others or, or coming across as if I'm being trying to accuse others. You know, many times you were saying, not to accuse, but sometimes it feels that way, you know? Um, and so I guess, you know, reconciling those things. Um, it feels like sometimes we have to take action in order to prevent violence from happening in the world. Um, and how we reconcile that, I'm, I'm not sure. And maybe it's just a, um, a problem of interpretation or something like that. Thank you for that very important question, Emily. And um, uh, yes, Ria is saying nonviolent communication is what first comes to mind. We can always speak up without it being violent, agreed. Um, and also I think is remembering that when we move from a place of love, our actions are so much more powerful and they're different than they, when we move from a place of anger. So there can be, when there's in social, um, injustice, social injustices, um, anger can arise, but the invitation is to go back to love before we take any action, because otherwise this is when, when things get messy, right? When we see people rioting and those things. So Mahatma Gandhi will tell us time and time again, told us that violence will only result in more violence. Does it mean that we shut up and we don't say anything? No, but we come from a place of love, always coming from a place of love. And um, I appreciated what you said, like, you know, it doesn't, it feels like an accusation sometimes. We are not responsible for how people receive our message because we can't control that but we can certainly tune into our intention before we speak before we act what is my deepest intention and if it doesn't come from love pause until you can connect to love and then act always from this empowered place of love seeing even the quote-unquote enemy with loving eyes with compassion why are they behaving the way they are compassion for them not pity, compassion, which is very different. Um, but thank you so much for that question because I think it's really relevant. Um, and I think Alana said, I find that when we're open about new perspectives and new teachings, we're blessed to learn so much about ourselves and what we may need to focus on in our own personal journeys toward a life of love. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and, and we're all learning, right? Like, so that's why I think Ahinza is so important that we're like, oh, I wasn't the best version of myself then, like, that's okay, like, okay, moving on, we learn, and we better ourselves in a way, in a conscious way, how can I be more conscious, more mindful, but this is not to say I'm gonna sit and feel so bad about how I wasn't who I am now a year ago, I was trying my best then too, oh no, someone's entering the room, we're about to finish, Okay. Um, are there any final comments or questions? I guess I just want to say thank you for taking the time to teach what you've learned and what has obviously made a significant shift and change in your own life. How beautiful is it to be able to be surrounded by people that sort of have that like-minded 
focus. So thank you. I know I came in late, but I lost track of time, <laughs> but it was, you know, beautiful what I did here and what I did learn. So really, really thank you. Thank you so much, sister. Really appreciate your kind words of appreciation of gratitude. And, uh, and actually, I, I want to say to reciprocate that to each one of you, because um, every time we, we teach, we learn. So every time when I was preparing for this presentation, I was relearning and noticing how I'm understanding these things differently to how I understood them five, six years ago when I was doing my first teacher training. And so I'm looking at these concepts with new eyes because I've evolved, I'm growing spiritually and, and there I can be different in my life and then inspire others. And now sharing this with you guys is, the most beautiful gift because then I know that you will all take whatever you are able to take in this moment, whatever can be absorbed um, and can only contribute positively to how you um, show up in life. And uh, I also want to thank Ria, who's um, hidden, but she is here, um, who reached out to me to organize this event as a fundraiser. There are endless causes um, for which we can raise funds, for which we can speak up, for which we can care, at least. Um, and I think it is not our responsibility to care for all of us, because uh, all of them, because otherwise we're not able to function. However, there are certain causes which we may feel closer to and um, having lived in Panama. I know some of you lived in Panama. Some of you have been there. We have a Panamanian person here representing just one, but very grateful for you, Alvaro. Um, and I know Ria has been as well. And every single human life is equally valuable and we can all contribute to different causes to different human lives um, and in this particular fundraiser we ask you to find it in your heart to make a donation um, because there are people the Nagave Bugle people in Panama who have been displaced um, and they've lost you know talking about Aparigraha they've lost everything so they don't have a roof they don't have a bed they don't have anything and if you can even just for one second, imagine what it would be like to find yourself in that situation with your family and how heartbreaking it would be. And to imagine to receive help from people living in other countries, connecting with you and to be able to give whatever it is, whatever you can give. Um, I think it's really a, a motive to, to give generously and to share the message. So sometimes we're not able to give financially. I did say this was, you know, it's, a, it's open to everyone because actually you just learning this is a gift to humanity because the more conscious we can be, that's already a positive contribution to the world. Um, so if you're not able to give financially, can you spread the word? Can you tell people about this cause? Can you tell them about this class because I've recorded this so you'll be able to share it as well and then anyone can make a donation. Um, so the um, the actual PayPal is, um, would you mind putting it in the chat Ria? It's sales at geoparadise.com, I think. Um, yeah, well, it's on the flyer as well of the event. Uh, if you're not sure, you can find also the tribal gathering page on Instagram. If you want to donate, I'm sure you'll find a way. <laughs> um, and before we part ways, I just want to invite you to um, bring your hands together at your heart center to sit up for one more time, to breathe deeply and to remember that you're a drop in the ocean and the ocean in a drop and that the same life, the same consciousness that animates you is the same consciousness that animates all beings, our brothers and sisters in Panama, as well as all other living beings everywhere in the world. Lokaha samastaha sukino bhavantu. May all beings everywhere be happy.
and free. And may all our thoughts, our words, and our actions contribute to the happiness and freedom of all beings everywhere. If you'd like to lift your prayer to the space in between your eyebrows, the light in me sees and honors the light in each one of you. This is the meaning of Namaste. Thank you all for your presence. Thank you for caring. Thank you for being open to evolve, to grow, to learn. And uh, thank you for existing. <laughs> your existence is a blessing in this world. So thank you. And um, if you have any questions, oh, I will use this as a tiny opportunity for promotion. I'm offering a yoga teacher training in person in Guatemala in February, where we cover this in a much wider spectrum. So if you feel called to learn some more over 21 days, please get in touch and I'll be happy to provide you with all the information. Thank you so much. <laughs>